Uh, now, if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, uh, would you open up to the uh, to the book of the Acts of the Apostles? I'm right in the first chapter. And no, I'm not going right now to the Holy Spirit chapter, but I do want to start and in Acts 1, and I'm going to start in uh, verse 7. Jesus is speaking. This is right before he ascends into heaven. This is right before he leaves this wor- world, this world, to take his rightful seat at the right hand of the Father. Acts 1, 7. Actually, I'm going to start in 6. So when they had come together, they were asking Jesus, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are going to restore the kingdom of Israel? They were still caught up on that, you know? And uh, they, would ha- they had to wait till 1948 <laughs> to that. But, and not even in the way they thought it was, but there was a restoration of Israel. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Israel, both in Jerusalem, and in all of Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. I shared a little bit about what, what historically, what uh, Pentecost is all about. Jesus uses the word here called dynamis. Dynamis is the same word that translates to us for, for um, dynam- dynamite, explosion, explosive power, right? You know, there's only one other time that Jesus uses that, and that's when he's talking about, uh, you remember when he healed the woman with the issue of blood? She had been bleeding for how many years? A long time. 15? 14 years? I think so too. And he says, I felt the power come out from me. Do you remember that? And they're like, Lord, Lord. But he was talking about a certain power that was like dynamite going forth. In this passage, he says, but you will receive dynamite power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all of Sam- uh, in Judea and Samaria and even to the uttermost. I want to tell you something this morning that that same power that was going to be experienced by the apostles is still part of our lives. Sometimes we try to clean things up too much. But I want to tell you something. That there is a, there is a promise in the second chapter of Acts, uh, the 38th verse, that it says that this promise, after they received the Holy Spirit, and you know the story, and you can read Acts chapter 2 if you're not familiar with the story. But in Acts chapter 2, they're assembled in the upper room and they are praying. And the Holy Spirit fell. And when the Holy Spirit came upon them, it appeared as fire. And then it, it separated and fell on each one of the apostles. And there was fire in the house. See, whenever the Holy Spirit's around, there's fire in the house. That fire is similar to that dunamis power that Jesus is talking about. It is the fire of the Holy Spirit that brings forth wisdom and change and healing and all of those things. It is that power that we see in the life of Jesus Christ. That Holy Spirit that brings wisdom. I, I wrote a, a few Bible verses. I just want to share them with you. Let me see if I can find them. I use three by five cards. Bad move. That's not a good thing to do, you know, because I can't find everything. Okay, let me just, uh, just a few things. First of all, the Holy Spirit frees us from the law. Galatians 5.18. You don't have to go there. The Holy Spirit... Frees us. I'm going to go there because I want to read it right from the scripture. I, I won't read them all, but from the scriptures. But uh, you can. Uh, but I want to put it in context. Galatians five, and uh, uh, let's start in seven uh, sixteen. Galatians five sixteen. 
But I say, Paul says, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. If we are walking by the the, the wisdom and power of the Holy Spirit, we're not going to ca- get caught up in some sexual immorality. We're not going to get caught up in in uh, some kind of uh, a Ponzi scheme or, or selling something out or burglary or any of those other things. If we're following the Holy Spirit, he says this, that if you walk by the Spirit, capital S, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Verse 17, for the flesh sets its desire against the Holy Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh, for there are an opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. In other words, the things that that, uh, we desire to do in our natural man, we have the power to resist those. So uh, if you have a propensity for something that you know is in direct conflict to what the Holy Spirit calls for you in your life, you have the power to combat that. As we were talking about healing, you have the power when you have the Holy Spirit to do the battle that I spoke about last week. You see, our desires, our fleshly desires, go absolutely against the holiness of God through the Holy Spirit. It is by that that we live our lives. That's good stuff. And I'm not even to my verse yet. That was good stuff. It says, For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. But, but, if you are led by the Holy Spirit, you are not under the law. You are not under the law. All those laws and, and regulations. We, some of us came from a church that was filled with laws and regulations. We are not under the law. Why? Because if the Holy Spirit has control of our lives, he does battle for us and he shows us what's of God and, and what's not of God. So we don't need to have somebody saying, oh, your skirt's too short. Oh, you, uh, you're, you're not wearing your hair in a bun, ladies. Oh, I can't, and I got saved, let me tell you. Oh, you know, we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to, did I break this law? Did I break this law? Did I break this law? Do I have to go to confession every Friday night or Saturday afternoon? Did I do this? Do I have to do this? Oh, God, bless me, bless me, bless me. But that doesn't mean we don't repent. That means that if your desire is to follow the Holy Spirit, you follow out of your heart and not of your flesh. You see how it's a much higher calling? Some people try to mix Old Testament and New. i got to tell you, Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. And if you're with the Holy Spirit, you don't have to worry about the law. It says it right here. But if you are led by this... There is a but, though. But if... You are led by the Spirit of God. You're not under the law. And is somebody going to be happy about this this morning? Or am I going to have to dance a Holy Ghost dance just because, um, because I can't stand it. I can't stand it. I, when you think about what they, what they had to live under in the Old Testament, then came Jesus. Then came Jesus. And He prepared us all that, those three years. For the coming of the Holy Spirit, the it, the whole Old Testament. Where there's Isaiah, there's you know Daniel. There's a whole lot of them talking about the coming Messiah, preparing us for Jesus. Jesus comes and He prepares us for the Holy Spirit. Oh, come on! There is power. So the Holy Spirit frees us from the law. The Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. Yeah, amen. Get rid of those demons. The the Holy Spirit brings wisdom. I want to go backwards a little bit to um, to uh, Isaiah because uh, Isaiah, one of Isaiah's prophecies, does it. I'll go there. You don't have to go, but I'm going back to Isaiah 11. Let me find it for you. I'll read it. But it's good. Isaiah 11, and I'm starting at the very beginning of Isaiah 11. 
Um, uh, Isaiah says, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots, and will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. He's talking about Jesus, the root of Jesse. Then it says, The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Those are the things that were prophesied that the Holy Spirit would bring through Jesus. If he, if he brought him through Jesus, he's going to bring him through us, if we're open for him. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit brings about God's children. Romans 8.14 In 1 Corinthians, I'm going to go there. In 1 Corinthians 12, we all know this one, but I'm going to read it anyway. 1 Corinthians 12, and uh, let me just quickly read it. I'm going to start right at the verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, we were pagans before we accepted Jesus. We believe anything. We would go anywhere. We were without direction. We did what our flesh wanted us to do. And if we got in trouble, we got in trouble. If we wanted something, we took it. It was all about us. It's not that way anymore. He says, when you were pagans, you were led astray by the mute idols. However, you were led. Therefore I make it known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts but the same Spirit and there are a variety of ministries and the same Lord and there are varieties of effects but the same God who works all things in all persons. And then he goes on for the next four or five verses to talk about, you know, to this one is given the manifestation of gifts, to this one is the gift of healing, to this one is gets this gift, this one gets this gift. But what the point he's making is that we are living afresh, anew. That in our old days we went this way and that way and this way. But now we are speaking uh, that God, um, we are speaking through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he just doesn't, doesn't come alone. He brings gifts. Isn't that good? I always had an aunt who used to bring gifts. I love that aunt. When I was a kid, oh boy, aunt Alice is coming. She's the one that brings gifts. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes not just to be some sort of entity in your life like a ghost. We used to call it the Holy Ghost, right? And then finally everybody got together and they said, that, that's weird. And they, people have to, ooh. I still refer to him sometimes as the Holy Ghost just because of my background. But, but the Holy Spirit comes bringing gifts, restoring our faith, giving us wisdom and understanding, giving us the, 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 the focus to go forward even when we don't even know where we're going, my goodness. Where are we headed? I don't know, but I'm following the Holy Spirit. I don't know. I may be going up to New Hampshire to some Catholic church someplace with all those things. I'm going. If the Holy Spirit leaves, I'm going to go. Because he's got a plan. Now, in all of that, I want to just tell you that this power that was received on Pentecost um, was so special. I want you to, I, I'm going to go to, um, uh, to Acts 2 now, but I want to point out a few things. Now, Acts 2 is the day of Pentecost. But I want to say, tell you that Acts 2 was very interesting. They had gathered in the upper room and waiting for something called the Holy Spirit. I will send you the Comforter, who, which is the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, you go and wait and pray, and I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. And so they were obedient. They went up. There was the apostles and the disciples, about 120 of them. By the way, there were women up there with them. And uh, so the, they're, they're praying. They were doing church business in the upper room. Sort of like our churches these days. Sort of like Christ Community Church. Doing business. Praying. Doing business. They, they, uh, they voted Matt, uh, Matthias in to take Jude's place in the upper room at that time. 
They were having conversations. They were praying. They were going about the business of, they didn't call it that at that time, but the early church. But something was going to break through that changed the course of the church of Jesus Christ. In just a, a, a few hours, something was, a, was going to change them forever. Prior to this moment, I've said this before, you probably know exactly where I'm going, but prior to this, you have Peter who says, let's go fishing. He was ready to go back to his the life that he knew before Jesus. He was ready to go B.C. And you know, so many times, I look at people, you know, it's heartbreaking for a pastor. I see people who come to me and say, the Lord is leading me out of the church. And I go, <coughs> okay, where is it he leading to you? I, I don't know, but he's leading me. He's leading you out of this church to a place that you don't know. Yes, sort of like Abraham. I see. So you're Abraham. And so so they leave. And they wander. More like Moses. And they never find a home. They never stop. It's heartbreaking. Because whether they're afraid of the discipline that I preach or whether they're afraid to take the next step or maybe they're just bored, you know. Maybe they say, well, I've heard all of her sermons before. Uh, Whatever it is, whatever the devil has whispered in their ear, they leave from where God has placed them to go somewhere where they they don't even know what they're doing. And you can tell because some people have left here three years ago, four years ago, are still not part of a church. You know, they're not getting fed. They don't have a pastor who cares for them and loves them. They don't have a church body that is in it with them to win it. It's a heartbreak for us because we know, listen, there, this is not a life for, 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 for wimps. There should be a book. Church life is not a life for wimps. It's not. We struggle in this church. All of us have our issues. There are issues within this body that we have to deal with. You know, there are times when we get tired. You know, I look at Jim and Ben and and, and Karen and and all of that they do, uh, 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 Cheryl and, and all that people are doing physically around here. And I go, oh, they look tired. What can I do? They look tired. And I can't help them. I pray for them. And I want to encourage them. It's not easy walking with the Lord. It, it, the Lord calls us into a sacrificial life. The Lord calls us into a discipline. The Lord will discipline us if we are following closely. Why? Because He only chastises those that He loves. Do you understand how important each one of us is? That each one of us has been been given gifts by the Holy Spirit so that we would upbuild the body. See, we don't get how important we are. I see it every day. I I can tell you, even where I work at Southington Care Center, you know, you get together with uh, the housekeepers or the laundry people, and they go, oh, we're, we're nobody, we're just the laundry people, we're in the basement. And I want to say, you're just the laundry If you don't do your job, we're all going to stink around here. Tell me you're not more important than some of the administrators we've got hanging around here. Do we do that here to one another? I pray not. Because every single person has a gifting from God. Every single person is as important as the next person and is as important as the pastor who's trying to lead them. Every single person. The question is, Have we opened our heart to that power? Have we asked the Holy Spirit in? Have we been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Jesus breathed on the apostles along the Sea of Galilee and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. That was a clear distinction. He breathed on them. So as Christians, symbolically, He breathes on us. He gives us the Holy Spirit. But there's another step. Some people teach that it happens all at once. 
And do you know what? After studying the scriptures for more than 25 years, more than 30 if I want to be honest, um, I see very distinctly that there are two separate instances every single time. Let me go to here a little bit. When the day, uh, chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one. So it wasn't just the apostles. I'm reading this now, and I'm realizing it was. I just always traditionally thought it was the apostles. It says it rested on each one of them. So everybody in the upper room had this little tongue of fire. Remember the pictures? I was never really sure what that was. Sort of looked like, you know, alfalfa, kind of the the tongue of fire coming off your head. But but when you uh, but it was a visual representation, of course, but. But you know what happened? That that Holy Spirit fell and then it was distributed. I got to tell you, this is very important. This mimicked what God did in the Old Testament. I'll tell you why. I want to make sure I get this. The Holy Spirit fell twice in the Old Testament on a group. The first time it fell was in Leviticus in the ninth chapter. And it was the dedication of the tabernacle by Moses and all the the people in the wilderness. That was the first time. And you read the story in Leviticus and they built a tabernacle. And so that was that traveling that traveling presence of God and they would put it down and establish it and the Holy Spirit would came, boom! And the presence of God filled the Ark of the Covenant and there it was in the wilderness for all of the people. And the people came and, and prayed outside and the high priest went in once a year to into the Ark of the Covenant. That was the first time. Second time. Second Chronicles. It's the dedication of the temple that Solomon built. Boom! The Holy Spirit comes down. When you read that story, you see the people are overcome. That each one of them felt God's presence two times. The Holy Spirit in the New Testament comes when Jesus breathes on the people. The Holy Spirit comes when they're in the upper room the second time. But in the upper room, something happens. The first time, uh, uh, as the Holy Spirit comes in that upper room that day, it comes as an entity, a a, a fireball or a, a something, the mighty sound of rushing wind. It's something supernatural is happening. The Holy Spirit is making himself known, right? Sort of like what they did at the tabernacle. Everybody saw it. Everybody experienced it as a whole. He was dealing the, for the first time with the tabernacle to bring worship to the to the people, to worship Almighty God. That was the when the Holy Spirit entered that upper room, that's what happened. And then what happened? Then it was the Temple of Solomon already again. Where each person what does God say about us? What does God say about it? You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you see after that that time in the second chapter, first the Holy Spirit falls and then it infuses himself in our hearts. And then we go out with this dunamis power. But do you understand that now you know why the Holy Spirit dwells within us? So if the Holy Spirit dwells within us, the power of God falls and and continually brings us forward in power, love, admonition, glory to God. I want to tell you that if you have not experienced the power of the Holy Spirit, I want you to ask God, I'm going to be here after service. I want to pray for you because I want to tell you something. That without that power, we are missing the Holy Spirit. 
And you may say, well, I don't talk in tongues. I didn't ask anything about the gifts. I'm asking, do you have the power? Sometimes we run on empty. We're tired and we're, we've been working so hard. And yet, somehow the Holy Spirit comes in and we go, Lord, thank you. I got this. I'm, I'm ready to roll, Lord. And he says, <laughs> remember the scene in, remember this scene in Superman and Superman uh, catches Lois Lane and uh, he says, don't worry, I got you. And she says, got me? Who's got you? <laughs> The, the Lord, we say, I got this, Lord. I feel the power. I feel the unction. I'm, I'm feeling more revived. And the Holy, and the Lord says, I got you. You see, it's a matter of our life. It's a matter of going forward. After this, the apostles never turned back, fully knowing they faced martyrdom, fully knowing that they would be ostracized, that they would be imprisoned and beaten, fully knowing that they have given it all to Jesus Christ. We talk about revival. You know, I have to tell you, I've, I've been asking the Lord. I, I Honestly, I, you know, I, I said, Lord, I don't know what's going on. Why aren't we growing? Why aren't there more people here? What am I doing wrong? What can I do? What, how can I inspire? And i got to tell you that unless we get a handle on the fact that we submit our ourselves to the Lord and then the Lord brings about the change in us and the change in the church we're never going to go forward unless there's fire in the church and fire that comes from our heart the church will not grow we are seeing churches close so fast right now pastors are leaving over a hundred pastors a month quit the ministry Quit something that they've preached on their whole life. Quit something that they know they've been called by God and ordained. And somehow they can turn their back on the church and walk away from the calling of God. I'm telling you that unless we are submitted to God, we will not stand. Christ Community Church will not stand as a church co- collectively. And we will not stand. We will, As we look at others who have left and are wandering in the wilderness, we will be as they. I am telling you by the power and the unction of God that without our submission to the Holy Spirit, without our saying, yes, Lord, do with me what you would have me do. Holy Spirit, come and fill me. Holy Spirit, overflow, baptize me in in you, almighty God. Baptize me in your Holy Spirit. We cannot stand. How can we stand without the power of God in our hearts? How can we not stand? If we don't have that Holy Spirit flowing through us every day, we go back to the law. And not only do we go back to the law, we put that in the church. Hey, you missed last week. You're sinning. Oh, hey, you know what? You're doing this wrong. You're raising your kids wrong. You're, you know, dealing with your husband wrong. You're doing this wrong. Why don't you pray more? Why don't you do read your Bible more? Why are you always so aloof? We've got a million excuses to blame everybody else. But that's because we're not right. And i got to tell you, church, it starts right here. I keep saying to the Lord, Lord, I know your power. I've seen your power. I've preached your power. Help me have your power even for today. Help me know who to talk to. Help me know how to encourage somebody to, to come and hear the word of God that comes from this pulpit every Sunday. I'm not bragging on me. I'm telling you, the word of God comes from this pulpit every Sunday. Because God is in charge. There is no revival. How can you revive something that's dead? If you are feeling dead and don't know the power of the Holy Spirit, you need to know the power of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes it comes very softly and very, very quietly. When I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I was by myself in my bedroom. I had heard all about it. I had started to, I came back from the condo, I had started to go back to that, that, uh, little fundamentalist Pentecostal church where they all had the Holy Ghost, you know, shakes and all that. I loved it. But I had never received what they were talking about. And one night, I was going to bed, went upstairs, knelt by my, my bed for my, my evening devotions. And I just said, Lord, if it's true, I need it. I need the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. Will you baptize me in your Holy Spirit? That's a I mean, I wish I could say. And then the heavens opened up. Boom! I was laid out flat. It didn't happen. 
And I closed my eyes. And I felt the peace of God come to me. I felt his hand in my heart. And I, I felt at peace with God. And that's all I thought. And I went to bed. And the next morning, as I walked across campus, somebody said, what's with you? I said, what? They said, you've been smiling all during class. You walked out of here, because we, walk, we, we walked to the, the student union together. You walked out of here, you're smiling, you're not talking much, but you're smiling, you're talking. And I went, I don't know. So I went back to the old pastor that was there, and I said, what? Did I get the baptism of the Holy Spirit? He says, any way the Holy Spirit wants to give it to you is the right way. And all of a sudden, I began to realize it. And I began to walk in it. You know, some of us have had an experience with the Holy Spirit. And we said, oh, no, no, I don't want to walk in it. It's too scary. He's going to tell me i got to do this or do this or do this. I'm not ready for that. And I want to tell you, Get your hands off your life. Let the Holy Spirit take over your life. You will be happy. You'll fulfill the promises of God and the purposes that God has for your life. There can be no revival unless we bring the fire. Got it? We have the fire in our hearts to bring the fire. Every place you step your foot, every place that you Put your foot down. You go to school, Jenica, every time you walk through that classroom, you bring the Holy Spirit. It's not something you have to rev up. The Holy Spirit is within you, bearing witness by other people who see it in you. May not understand it. They say, oh, Jenica's a nice person. But but there's power in there. Every time we go into a situation where somebody's sick or needs a a helping hand or we pray for somebody or somebody's asking us for help because they don't know what to do with their kid or or their elderly parents or whatever, we bring the Holy Spirit. Who, Who is he? Why, he's the God of all wisdom. He's the God of all healing. He's the God that brings understanding in the midst of confusion. I don't know about you. I need him. I need him every day. 